Welcome back to Bible study. We are coming towards the exciting conclusion of the story of Esther, at least a pretty, pretty pivotal turning point. And so we will be looking at chapter seven, starting back at, up at chapter seven. Uh, just before this, remember Queen Esther had invited the king and the enemy Haman to a series of two banquets. The first one has happened and she has made presentation to the king and got him on board to accept the request that she really wants to make. She hasn't made that request yet because there's still the second banquet coming. And there has been a bit of the reversal already started where the king realizes that Mordecai is a good guy. Uh, Mordecai and Esther are cousins and the king wants to reward Mordecai for helping avert an assassination attempt. And now Haman, who hated Mordecai, had to show all the honor and all the support to Mordecai. And just at the end of that time of great shame is time now for the second banquet. But before we pick up with that in chapter 7, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Merciful God, you are the source of every blessing in our lives Help us to be aware of these blessings and to be thankful for them. Keep us from the temptation of fear when we venture into the unknown. Help us always to trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so now uh, coming into chapter 7, it's time for the second day of the banquet the banquet of Queen Esther. Let's look at verse um, 1 through 4, chapter 7. So the king and Haman went in to the feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, the second day of the banquet, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you and what is your request? Even half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther replied and answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. So remember, uh, first Queen Esther had asked to have the king do her a favor to come to a banquet. The king agreed. And then on the first day of the banquet, uh, when everyone was happy, the king said, well, what would you, uh, what is your request? And the queen said, well, my request is that you will come back a second day for another part of the banquet and that then I can make my request. And the king said, okay. So what this has done is it's actually really strongly predisposed the king to be affirmative whenever Queen Esther finally does make her request. So after all of this preparation, she does finally make the request. Remember at this point that Haman is just, he's just been full of the shame of having to show honor to Mordecai, the Jew who was his enemy. And he was probably maybe feeling at least some consolation out of that shame of still coming to do something that seemed very, very honorable, which would be to have a private banquet with just himself and King Ahasuerus and Queen Esther. So that was perhaps um, soothing some of the hurt that he was feeling, but he still has no idea that there's any connection between Queen Esther and Mordecai. And so now finally, 
Queen Esther makes this request and she follows all the court protocol. It shows how she's using all the experience and the wisdom that she's gained of being a queen and she's using that to every advantage to achieve this request and this petition, both first for her own life, but then in addition, asking for the life of her people. And she uses that phrase, we have been sold. Now, she could have said, King Ahasuerus, you took money. You sold out my people. You took a bribe. But she puts it in a more general way of expression. So she keeps the king off the hook, which is smart because you don't want to accuse someone who you hope will be giving you a favor. So she just uses it in that general, we have been sold. And she never accuses the king of ever being part of that. However, Haman is the one who made the bribe and he might start to have a little bit of an inkling that this isn't a good situation. And this at the same time, she points out, if this proceeds, um, both her death and the death of her people, that this would do great damage to the king's reputation. So she puts everything in the best light for him and for the king to look good, which again, strategically, it's very, very wise of her. Well, how does the king King respond to this request, which he finally, finally gave after all these days in preparation. So this is um, picking up verse 5 through 8. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king rose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden, but Haman stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king had determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining and the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Finally, finally, after all these um, different crisscross of communication and uh, waiting and waiting to hear what is this request, and finally it's made, and once the king hears this, he is enraged. Who would dare hurt his beloved queen? And this is, again, the pivotal moment. You can kind of imagine the dr drama of this, this is the man, this Haman. He is the enemy. He is wicked. He is our foe forever and ever. Well, again, what's interesting about this whole picture, though, is that King Ahasuerus just doesn't seem to be anyone who cares a whole lot about the details of the running of his empire because he was offered this bribe. He was going to allow this whole group of people to be killed uh, under the decree, under the order of Haman. And he never wondered at all who, who they are. Didn't even seem to matter. But now, now he knows the connection. This relates to his own queen, to the Queen Esther. Now at this moment, it's still not brought out directly that this is that she is Jewish and that this is against the Jewish people, but Haman now knows what this is all about. And he also knows he must have some idea about this being a connection with Mordecai. Well, the king is furious, understandably, and he leaves, perhaps, um, you know, sometimes you have to go uh, take a little walk to have a little time to calm down. I thought about that was interesting where it uh, mentions that he goes out into the garden. I think sometimes 
when we need to calm down, having a chance to just be in nature, um, look at greenery, a little more challenging where we are, uh, but just sometimes a little fresh air, um, hopefully a cooler time of the day. For some people, it's going on a walk by the ocean, but that there's something that truly happens when we are able to be outdoors and that can help us, it truly does. Well, at any rate, he goes out to uh, kind of find a little bit of peace, maybe so he could even just talk. He was probably so angry he couldn't even talk. In the meantime, understandably, Haman, he knows that he's in huge trouble. He knows that his life is in the balance. And so he does appeal to Queen Esther. And again, throughout the whole story, there's always these reversals happening. At one point, Haman seemed to have all the power. Now he's the one who has to turn around and beg from Queen Esther. Uh, apparently it, it describes it like he kind of throws himself to her mercy. And I can imagine uh, someone, uh, you know, like he's, she's, she's at her, her reclining, uh, her bed, her couch, and he probably reached out to try to, you know, appeal. But when the, once the king sees this, he interprets it saying, what now? You're going to attack my queen if it wasn't bad enough. And I think it's really interesting, the phrasing, as the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. It's just as if the, um, when, you know, they used to hang people, they put the cover over their head. It's kind of as if an awareness is on him that this is it. There's just no way. This is, this is the end. Well, then at this moment, uh, one of the eunuchs, in the story, uh, one of the palace people who serves in the palace, one of these eunuchs comes along and has an idea. Um, when we read that, I thought it is interesting how many times these eunuchs are part of the group of people who serve the king, the queen, and how often they seem to have just the right advice at just the right time. Being people who you would think have absolutely really no power, and yet they seem to be able to um, bring influence by mentioning, again, just the right thing at just the right time. They also keep the story going. But at any rate, uh, they, there's another one of these uh, servants in the palace who speaks up and has also makes a difference. And so this is in chapter 7 and verse 9 and 10. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king was abated. So that kind of took away that uh, instant and wrathful feeling of the king. Now at this moment, again, it's that turnabout. The twist is that the very place where Haman thought he was going to have his revenge upon Mordecai, it instead turns into he has set up his own death sentence because once the king is made aware that, well, hey, look there, there's a place for execution already and made, then it doesn't take but barely an instant and the king can declare it to be so. Well, at this moment, you would almost feel like once we've reached this conclusion of chapter seven, it's like, yay, that's it. That's the happy ending, right? Not quite because even though Esther, her life is now safe. There's another part of this that isn't quite resolved yet. And so we have to find out more of what happens next. And so we pick up in, in chapter 8 now. So even though for Esther and Mordecai, the picture is very good, at the same time, the picture for the Jewish people is still very, very dangerous. So that's uh, 
picking up in chapter 8, uh, verse 1 and 1 and 2. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. Then the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. So Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So now things are, again, starting to turn around. And this is the first point where finally Queen Esther actually makes it known that there is a connection between herself and Mordecai. And given that the king had already come to be very positive about Mordecai because he had saved the king's life, and Esther is his beloved queen, it was probably a really good news for him to find out, oh, wow, and they're actually connected. And, and the fact that she is Jewish is not good or bad, but it does make him begin to care a little more about the Jewish people. But there's still something that could go wrong here, and that's where we have to hear how the story continues in chapter 8 and verse 3 through 6. And Esther will have to act uh, decisively again. Then Esther spoke to, again to the king. She fell at his feet, weeping and pleading with him to avert the evil design of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. The king held out the golden scepter to Esther, and Esther rose and stood before the king. She said, If it pleases the king, and if I have won his favor... And if the thing seems right before the king, and I have his approval, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote, giving orders to destroy the Jews who are all in, in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming on my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? So the thing is, if remember earlier in the story, uh, Haman had sent out this order far and wide, well in advance of a proposed time when all of the Jewish people would be wiped out. But King Ahasuerus had never known that the particular order applied to the Jewish people. I find it interesting because earlier in the leading up and in her requesting to King Ahasuerus, everything that Esther did was very, very dignified, uh, using her all her royal etiquette, all of her ability, and the kind of power that she did at least have as the queen. But at this moment and at this point, when she turns to appeal for the sake of her people, she, she does not hold back. She turns to him with a very emotional kind of an appeal, which is still, I think, actually very wise on her part. It seems to me that she knows how to read a situation, and she knows how she can best appeal to the king. Before, while she was leading up to this request uh, to spare herself and spare her people, remember, she always had Haman in the picture as well. So she had to always act in complete as being the queen, that he would always continue to believe her in that way completely fully and not ever make any association that she was a relative of Mordecai and that she herself was Jewish. But now this is truth is coming out. Now the king, this king, he just, he just didn't look at the big picture. And probably to his perspective, it's like, well, okay, got rid of Haman, done, all taken care of, 
Queen Esther is safe, Mordecai is safe, no more problem, let's just go on. And he could have easily forgotten about this whole huge group of people throughout the empire who did face destruction because it is told that whenever a decree goes forth, a decree will stand. It cannot be revoked if it has been given the stamp of the king, which Haman at the time was able to give it that kind of royal declaration. And so she has to appeal to him very personally, very strongly, using their personal and emotional connection to try to break through to the king in hope that, that somehow that terrible order can be stopped. Now she asks for it to be revoked, but in a way that might not have been possible. So we're gonna to have to find out how can, they, how can they possibly stop this order for destruction? What, what can be done? Well, this is uh, kind of where also uh, Mordecai and Esther together, they're going to have to work together to come up with uh, a solution to that situation, to that, to that challenge. So she makes this very emotional, very personal, deep plea to King Ahasuerus. And now we begin to hear how things might work out, hopefully. And verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to the Jew Mordecai, See, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he plotted to lay hands on the Jews. You may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Now you notice that this uh, things written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. And apparently this was part of, truly part of the system of the Persians' way of law so that it was um, kind of flip-flop, flip-flop. And a, it could not, the previous word could not exactly just be revoked. So something will have to be done to stop it. It made me uh, think about how in our uh, country, we at least have the opportunity to change laws. If some law after some time is determined just to be unjust or wrong, a uh, new law can be passed that can uh, actually just put away that law or amendments can be made, right? Amendments so that at least the problematic portion can be adjusted and changed uh, to be better, to work better. But in this time, in their, in their system, apparently it wasn't, that, it wasn't quite that easy. So there is still some challenge, some difficulty and worry. Are, are Esther and Mordecai going to be able to come up with a way to undo this evil that Haman has set in process, even though now, even though Haman is out of the picture, but it's kind of like the train has left the station. What's going to happen? How can they possibly stop this? Well, at least uh, both Esther and Mordecai together are given the authority to at least do all they can to fix it. I, I notice though that the king he always seems to sidestep um, his own responsibility. He seems very, very happy to keep handing off responsibility to others. But, um, you know, maybe that's a certain type of political savvy. Perhaps. I don't know. At any rate, um, we're happy, though, because our heroes, Esther and Mordecai, are now given the opportunity to deal with the challenge and the threat to their Jewish, their own people. So then um, they've been given authority. So next in verses 9 through 10, uh, we hear about what they start to do to uh, try to remedy this situation. So the king's secretaries were summoned at that time 
in the third month, which is the month of Sivan on the 23rd day, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews and to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to every province in its own script and to every people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. He wrote letters in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed them with the king's ring, and sent them by mounted couriers riding on fast steeds, bred from the royal herd. Let's see, I think that's where we want to go. Yeah, well, from there. So he's, he's written a new letter, a new command, a new decree, and it's going out on the very best horses throughout the entire empire. So uh, before this, though, there's maybe about roughly actually about 70 days seem to, according to the time that's described, have gone by to when uh, the king gives Esther and Mordecai permission to try to um, make a change that will put an end to this order for destruction of the Jewish people. Um, maybe the delay, we don't know why, but maybe they wanted to think about it, um, think of the right wording, think of the right way to put out a new decree that will help to um, avert, again, the disaster that was on its way. Well, this decree goes about, and it's interesting, just in the same directions and to all the people in all the languages in all the provinces, uh, just like when the decree went from Haman, it just kind of follows that same exact uh, pattern with an important addition that this also goes to all of the Jewish people throughout the entire province and also in their own language. And so when Haman's decree went out, it apparently was um, done in such a way that the people who were Jewish might not have ever realized that a threat to their life was actually on the horizon. It could have come upon them uh, as, a, as a great shock. Now, in some places, as within the, in the capital and where Mordecai, he learned of this, but perhaps in other, many other places, maybe they had no idea that, again, this disaster was heading their way. And then this new decree is, again, sealed with the king's ring. So Haman's decree was not revocable, but also this one that goes out from Mordecai is not revocable. Well, how's that going to work out? I think we'll find that it seems as though Mordecai, and probably in consultation with Esther, I think comes up with um, probably a good plan, at least for the situation they were facing. So we are to hear a little bit more about that. And this is um, verse chapter 8 and now verse 11 through 14. So by these letters, the king allowed the Jews, it says the king allowed the Jews, remember this is Mordecai's order, but it has the, the uh, affirmation, the ring, signet ring of the king on it. By these letters, the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to assemble and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them with their children and women and to plunder their goods on a single day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of the writ was to be issued as a decree in every province and published to all peoples and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take revenge on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift royal steeds, hurried out, urged by the king's command. The decree was issued in the citadel, citadel of Susa. So that's from the, the capital where, where Mordecai was. So if I'm getting the gist of this, what um, Mordecai sends out as a decree is that what Haman had sent out, which was actually giving the order to kill, destroy, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the Jewish people, the women and children, and take their goods. That was Haman's decree. So then what the order of Mordecai is, is giving a heads up and a warning and an opportunity for the Jewish people to prepare to defend themselves. So... Now, if those who had received the order from Haman 
decide to follow through with Haman's order and attack, the Jewish people also have their royally affirmed order that they have every right to defend themselves. So it seems to set up a bit of, um, gosh, it's awful, but it made me think a little bit of like the Cold War, almost a mutually assured destruction kind of strategy so that those who would have been planning to attack the Jewish people would have perhaps a really strong incentive to, to think twice about that. And in the meantime, if, if some did continue to attack, then the Jewish people would not have been caught off guard and helpless, but they would have been very ready and prepared to fight back. So, it's a little bit, um, not quite the same, but it is kind of towards uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And maybe to get people to stop and think before just jumping into following that decree that was really Haman's, but a decree from the emperor. And so it's kind of trying to just place back a certain kind of balance in, in the situation. None of it's good. But it was also, how were they going to deal with that d dangerous situation? And given that, this was probably, in the situation, the best option at that time. All right, so then, a um, little, little wrap-up at the end of this. Um, none of this has happened yet. This is just the, the, finally the answer. They came up with the answer. Finally, after all that work, to come up with at least a way to try to avert the destruction to save the Jewish people. Finally, uh, Mordecai does go about and kind of display his authority. And so this is in, uh, again, towards the end of chapter 8, it's verse 15 through 17. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king wearing royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown and a mantle of fine linen and purple, while the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. For the Jews there was light and gladness and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict came, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a festival and a holiday. Furthermore, many of the peoples of the country professed to be Jews because the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. I find that is very interesting. At this point, it sounds like we've got a conclusion. And to some extent, there is. There seems to be at least um, a way out of the predicament. And part of what this does establish, um, while it might seem strange that they couldn't just plain like, OK, wait, let's put out a cancellation and un press the undo button on the order that the decree that Haman sent out. That just wasn't the per Persian way, but at least they could counterbalance it. They could, so here was how the, the, uh, the thing was, here was the um, poor who had nothing, whereas the, um, the Jewish people had no power, and here was all the power that the Persians are those who would have carried out what Haman said. And so by what, by what Mordecai does is at least it brings things at least more on kind of an equal basis. And again, in that era, in that time, um, that was probably as close to some kind of justice as could be achieved. Now, when Mordecai goes out and about in these clothes and in this manner, uh, what this does also echo, as was mentioned earlier, about when you know how does one honor uh, the one who the king uh, wants to honor? This again very much echoes how Joseph was treated by the Pharaoh when Joseph was raised up to be in charge of practically everything, only next to Pharaoh in Egypt. And again, this is one of those moments where even though the Book of Esther never directly speaks of God's name. But this echo of the story of Joseph and how knowing from that story how God was 
involved and how God helped put Joseph in a place to serve ultimately to serve God's people and their good then we are meant to understand that again that God has been at work helping through Esther and Mordecai uh, bring them to a place of being able to help God's people who were facing uh, destruction and so again not directly but again we're meant to understand that God is here and I think that's true in life in a lot of ways. We have to keep our eyes open. It doesn't always hit us over the head. You know, that God is here and God is acting and God is bringing about good. And so we want to keep praying and reading scripture and opening our hearts so that we can see and recognize what God is doing and knowing that we can thank God for looking out and for caring for those who need God's help and that maybe we too can be part of that, bringing that help that sometimes people need in those predicaments, difficulties in life. Well, again, at this point we might think that's it, that's the end of the story, but it's not quite. There is still a, just a little bit more to the story of Esther, and so we will pick up on that next time, and we will conclude on this uh, great saga story of Queen Esther. Let's share in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may you have a very blessed week.